All right, let's get right into it. Your assigned problems may or may not have different randomized values. For best results, attempt the assignment on your own before watching these solutions. Students are encouraged to frequently pause the video to work out steps on their own before proceeding with the solutions. And here is the list of topics to be covered in this video. For problem one, we're going to find the domain of the function f of x equals x plus 10 over x squared plus 5x minus 50, and we're given five options to choose from. We merely need to determine which one is correct. Now for a rational function, one polynomial over another, the only restriction is that the denominator cannot be zero. So we go ahead and solve that the denominator x squared plus 5x minus 50 is not equal to zero. This factors as x plus 10 times x minus 5. Now if this product is not zero, then neither factor can be zero. In other words, x cannot be negative 10 and it cannot be five. As intervals, that is option C, all real numbers, but specifically excluding negative 10 and five. By the way, we have a factor of x plus 10 in the numerator and also a factor of x plus 10 in the denominator. Can we cancel them out? If x is not equal to negative 10, then yes. But if x is equal to negative 10, we would have zero over zero and that does not exist. Those two factors would not cancel specifically for negative 10. And this is why negative 10 is still not in the domain of this function, even though you might want to cancel the factors x plus 10 over x plus 10. Specifically for x equals negative 10, you cannot do that. For problem two, let f of x equal x minus two over 2x minus 5 times 2x minus 3, and we just need to find the domain. There are no radicals or anything. We simply have one polynomial divided by another. So the denominator can't be 0, which simply means x cannot be 5 halves, and it also cannot be 3 halves. Now we need to set this into uh, interval notation. So this is all real numbers except for specifically excluding 3 halves and then excluding 5 halves. Problem three, given that f of x equals negative two x plus eight over x minus one and g of x equals negative two x minus eight over negative three x minus three, we need to find the domain of the product f of x times g of x. The product of two numbers exists provided that both of those numbers exist. So for which x does f exist? All x other than one because it's a rational function whose denominator is x minus one. We merely require the denominator to not be zero. Similarly, the denominator of g not being zero excludes the value of x equals minus one. So overall, we can let x be any number except plus or minus one. For x equals plus one, f of x will not exist and then we cannot multiply it. For x equals minus one, g of x will not exist and we cannot multiply it. Otherwise, everything's fine. For problem four, given that f of x equals negative two x minus two over negative x plus two, and g of x equals negative x plus four over negative three x plus nine, we need to find the domain now of the quotient f of x over g of x. Now a quotient of two numbers existed, provided both numbers exist, and you are not attempting to divide by zero. So f of x exists except for x equals two, and g of x exists except for x equals three, both of which can be determined by looking at their denominators but the denominator f over g is zero if x equals four. Setting g of x equal to zero and solving would result in x equals four. So when x is four, g of x is zero, in which case f of x over g of x still doesn't exist, even though f of x exists and g of x exists, since g of x is equal to zero and you are attempting to divide by it, that is also removed from the domain. So altogether, x cannot be two because f would not exist. It cannot be three because g would not exist. And it cannot be four because then g would be zero and we are attempting to divide by it. For problem five, let f of x equal one over x minus three and g of x equals six over x plus five. We need to find the domain now of the composition f of g of x. The composition of two functions exists provided that the inner function exists and can then be plugged into the outer function. So we will need g of x to exist and f of g of x to exist. So the first thing we do is we get rid of any x's that cannot be plugged into g. Since g of x has division by x in it, x cannot be zero. Now observe looking at f, that f of three does not exist. Three is not in the domain of f. That does not mean, however, that you immediately remove it from the domain of the composition. Rather, g of x should not be three. G of x is what's being plugged into f, not x directly. So we set g of x equal to three and we're going to remove whatever x's solve this. So here's g of x equal three, subtract five from both sides, cross multiply and divide by the resulting negative two and you get x equals minus three. 
So x equals minus 3 is not in the domain of the composition because g of minus 3 is equal to 3, but then f of 3 does not exist. So altogether, we cannot have 0 and we cannot have minus 3. In problem 6, given that f of x is equal to 7x minus 6 over 3x minus 1, find the domain and range of the function and the inverse. So what's the domain of f? What is the inverse function? What's the range of f? So quickly looking at f of x, we see that in f of x, the only concern is that we not divide by 0. So solving that for x, we would see that x cannot be 1 third. So the domain of f is all x's other than 1 third. Now, it may seem counterintuitive, but the best way to find the range of f, which is part c, is to first find the inverse function, provided that such function exists. So we set y equal to f of x, switch x and y, and solve. So here is y equals f of x. Now we swap x's and y's. After doing some work, and this was done in a previous video, we find that f inverse of x is x minus 6 over 3x minus 7. So finding inverses was covered in unit 2a, so if you need a bit more review, stop here, go back and look at those questions. But from now on, finding inverses, we're not going to show every step. So we found f inverse of x to be x minus 6 over 3x minus 7. Now the range of f will be the domain of its inverse. So looking at the inverse function, which has a denominator of 3x minus 7, the domain of the inverse is all x other than 7 thirds, which means the range of the original function is all y's other than 7 thirds. In problem 7, we're going to find the composition f of g of x and its domain, provided f of x equals negative 6x over negative 7x plus 8, and g of x is negative 8 over negative 2x minus 4. So we need to find the composition and simplify it completely, and then we need to state its domain. To find the composition, we simply take g of x, which is negative 8 over negative 2x minus 4, and plug it in to the function f. Now this is kind of a mess, but notice that the numerator has g of x in it and the denominator has g of x in it. So both numerator and denominator are, have a term that is being divided by negative 2x minus 4. So if we multiply the numerator and denominator by negative 2x minus 4, we will clear out this denominator within a denominator kind of business. However, you can only multiply by this number, negative 2x minus 4 over negative 2x minus 4, if it's not 0 over 0. In other words, x cannot be equal to minus 2. Also observe that the domain of g of x does not include x equals minus 2. And we are multiplying by the denominator of g of x divided by itself, so for the same reason we are excluding x equals minus 2. However, when we multiply numerator and denominator, by negative 2x minus 4, we clear it out of the term 8 over negative 2x minus 4 in the numerator and denominator, and we end up with this expression here. We distribute and simplify, and we have 6 over negative 2x plus 3, however, still with the assumption that x cannot equal minus 2. And many books or sources are a little cavalier about this and don't keep track of the fact that our simplification absolutely required knowledge that x not be equal to minus 2. Otherwise, if x equals minus 2, you cannot even compute g of x to begin with. So here is our simplified form, 6 over negative 2x plus 3 for all x's except minus 2. So what's the domain of this composition? Well, its denominator cannot be 0. If we set negative 2x plus 3 equal to 0, we will solve for x cannot be 3 halves. We've also noted that x equals minus 2 is not in the domain of g, and we had to assume x not equal minus 2 in order to simplify this composition. So the domain of f of g is all x except 3 halves and negative 2. In problem 8, suppose we have the rational function f of x equals x squared minus x minus 2 over x squared plus 4x minus 12. Find if this function has any holes. And we have a few options. Now, rational functions have holes when there are shared roots between the numerator and denominator. The numerator factors as x minus 2 over x plus 1, and therefore has roots x equal 2 and x equal minus 1. The denominator factors as x plus two, 6 times x minus 2, so has roots at negative 6 and 2. There's a shared root of x minus 2, aka a shared factor of x minus 2, 
in the numerator and denominator of this function, that gives us a hole in the graph at x equals 2. In problem 9, we're going to have some functions and we are asked to determine long run behavior. First, what about x squared plus 1 over x plus 2? Does it have no horizontal asymptote, a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, or a horizontal asymptote at y equals 1? We're going to have to do the same thing for x squared plus 1 over, over x cubed plus 2, for x cubed plus 1 over x squared plus 2. And the thing to keep in mind is that for rational functions, when the denominator has larger degree, we have a horizontal asymptote of y equals 0. If the numerator and denominator have equal degree, you compute a horizontal asymptote to be y equals the ratio of the leading coefficients, and when the numerator has larger degree, there is no horizontal asymptote. There is, however, a slant or higher degree asymptote, but that's not what this problem is asking us about. So in problem, in the first part, we have x squared plus 1, that's degree 2, which is equal to the degree in the denominator. They both have degree 2. So we're going to compute the ratio of the leading coefficients. They both have leading coefficient 1, and 1 over 1 computes down to just be a horizontal asymptote at y equals 1. Next, we have degree 2 in the numerator and degree 3 in the denominator. So the degree of the denominator is larger than the degree of the numerator. That means we have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. Finally, we have degree 3 in the numerator and degree 2 in the denominator, and when the degree of the numerator is larger than that of the denominator, there is no horizontal asymptote. In problem 10, we have the rational function f of x equals negative 5 times x plus 91 times x minus 60 divided by x minus 46 times x minus 6 times x plus 53. Does this function have any holes? Does it have any vertical asymptotes? There are no shared roots between the numerator and denominator. We see that quite quickly because there are no factors that are identical and both have been fully factored. So the function does not have any holes. Vertical asymptotes, in contrast, correspond to roots of the denominator that are not already holes. So since there were no holes, every root of the denominator is in fact a vertical asymptote. So x equals 46, x equals 6, and x equals minus 53 are all vertical asymptotes. Problem 11, suppose f of x is equal to 3x minus 2 divided by 16x squared plus 24x plus 5, which has been helpfully factored for us as 3x minus 2 over 4x plus 5 times 4x plus 1. First, we are asked to give the domain of f in interval notation. Looking at the denominator, we cannot have either factor equal to 0, so it's all x's except negative 5 fourths and negative 1 fourth. So we take all numbers up to, but not including minus 5 fourths, everything in between minus 5 fourths and minus 1 fourth, but not including them, and then all numbers larger than minus 1 fourth and not including it. Next, the y-intercept is what point? We simply let x equal 0 and compute y. Once you compute through letting x equal 0, you'll get y is equal to negative 2 fifths, so there it is. What about the x-intercept or x-intercepts? Here we set y equal to 0, but notice that f of x is a single fraction. A fraction can only be 0 when the numerator is 0 and the denominator is not. So we set the numerator equal to 0 and find x equals 2 thirds. This does not make the denominator 0, so this is the only x-intercept is 2 thirds comma 0. There are vertical asymptotes at what value of x, roots of the denominator that aren't holes. Since there weren't any holes, we simply look at vertical asymptotes being roots of the denominator, which we already found in part a, x equals minus 5 fourths and x equals minus 1 fourth. And there is a horizontal asymptote where? Well, the degree of the denominator would be 2. If you fully expand that denominator, you'll get an x squared. The numerator, in contrast, has degree 1. It just has an x. And if the degree of the denominator is larger than the degree of the numerator, there is a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. In problem 12, find the horizontal asymptote of f of x equals negative 5x plus 3x cubed minus 3 divided by 5x cubed minus 2x cubed plus 2. This problem is really not very difficult, but it's been written in a way to try to look tricky. Both polynomials, the numerator and the denominator, we're going to write them in standard order, largest powers first, working our way down. Here we have 3x cubed minus 5x minus 3 divided by 5x cubed minus 2x cubed plus 2. But down in the denominator, we can simplify that because I have two different cubic terms. So in fact, f of x is given by 
3x cubed minus 5x minus 3 divided by 3x cubed plus 2. Now I have a cubic over a cubic. I have a degree 3 polynomial over a degree 3 polynomial. Those are the same degree. So there's a horizontal asymptote given by y is equal to the ratio of the leading coefficients. The leading coefficients are both 3, so y equals 3 over 3, which is equal to 1. For problem 13, let's let f of x equal 3x squared plus 13x plus 4 divided by 2x squared plus 1x minus 10. Where's the y-intercept? Well, we simply let x equals 0, and we would quickly compute that f of x is 4 over negative 10, or just negative 4 tenths. That, of course, simplifies to negative 2 fifths, so the y-intercept is the point 0 comma negative 2 fifths. What about x-intercepts or a single x-intercept? The numerator in this case is what we want to find roots of. It factors as 3x plus 1 times x plus 4. The denominator factors as 2x plus 5 over x minus 2. The reason we're factoring the denominator is in addition to finding roots of the numerator, we need to be sure they are not simultaneously roots of the denominator. So there's no shared roots. There are no holes in this function. So anything that makes the numerator 0 will make the function 0. That's just x equals minus 1 third and x equals minus 4 corresponding to those two factors. What about vertical asymptotes? There are no holes of this rational function, so anything that makes the denominator 0 will be a vertical asymptote. We've already factored the denominator as 2x plus 5 over x minus 2, so we have vertical asymptotes at x equals minus 5 halves and x equals 2. What about horizontal asymptotes? The numerator and denominator have the same degree. They are both degree 2 or quadratic polynomials. So we compute a horizontal asymptote by the ratio of the leading coefficients, which in this case is 3 over 2. For problem 14, we're asked to write an equation for a rational function with vertical asymptotes at x equals 4 and x equals 2, x-intercepts at x equal minus 3 and x equal minus 6, and a y-intercept at x equals 2. So the vertical asymptotes tell us the roots of the denominator, which tell us the factors. So since the two vertical asymptotes are x equals 4 and x equals 2, the denominator has factors x minus 4 and x minus 2. Similarly, the x-intercepts tell us roots of the numerator, which tell us factors of the numerator. So the numerator has factors x plus 3 and x plus 6. So, so far, here's what we know about our rational function. The numerator has factors x plus 3 and x plus 6, but it might be multiplied by an unknown function g, and the denominator has factors x minus 4 and x minus 2, but might be multiplied by an unknown function h. Now these two unknown functions do at least have to be polynomials because we know we're looking for a rational function. Now let's look at what the intercept tells us. If we plug in x equals 0, we are supposed to get out that f of 0 is equal to 2. So x plus 3 times x plus 6 when x is 0 just gives us 18, and x minus 4 times x minus 2 when x is 0 gives us 8. g of 0 and h of 0, there's not much we can do. So altogether, 9 times g of 0 over 4 times h of 0 should be equal to 2. If we cross multiply, we get 8 times h of 0 should equal 9 times g of 0. There are infinitely many ways I could pick polynomials, h and g, that would solve this. But the only restriction is that we need a rational function. There's no other information we need to account for, so let's make our lives easy and let h and g be the simplest polynomials we can, aka constants. In other words, h of 0 and g of 0 are just constant values, and the easiest way to then make these equal to each other is to let g of x equal 8 and h of x equal 9. Then we'll have 8 times 9 equals 9 times 8, which is true. So then, setting g of x equal to 8 and h of x equal to 9, we have f of x is equal to 8 x plus 3 x plus 6 over 9 x minus 4 x minus 2. In problem 15, let's write an equation for a rational function with vertical asymptotes at 2 and 3, x-intercepts at 1 and minus 1, a horizontal asymptote at y equals 5. Similar to the previous problem, the roots of the denominator are vertical asymptotes, which give us x minus 2 times x minus 3 as factors of the denominator. x-intercepts give us roots of the numerator, which give us factors of the numerator, x minus 1 times x plus 1. So what we know is the numerator has factors x minus 1, x plus 1, and an unknown polynomial g. The denominator has factors x minus 2, x minus 3, and an unknown polynomial h. The horizontal asymptote exists and isn't 0. That tells us that the numerator and denominator should have the same degree. g and h must therefore have the same degree, because other than g and h, we have an x squared in the numerator and an x squared in the denominator. 
So we have the same degree from our existing factors, which means g and h should have the same degree in order for overall the function f of x to have a numerator and denominator with the same degree. So the ratio of the leading coefficients after all is said and done should be 5. Our given information is that the horizontal asymptote is y equals 5. So the known factors have the same leading coefficient of 1. We have x minus 1, x plus 1, x minus 2, x minus 3. The numerator will distribute with a single x squared, and the denominator will also distribute with an x squared with a coefficient of 1. Therefore, we're going to get this 5 through the leading coefficients of g and h. Their leading coefficients must have ratio 5. The easiest way to do this, again, there's infinitely many ways we can, but let's make our lives simple, is to just use constants. So we want g and h to be constants and the ratio of their leading coefficients to be 5. Let's just use 5 and 1 respectively. Altogether, a possible solution is that f of x is equal to 5 times x minus 1 times x plus 1 divided by x minus 2 times x minus 3. For problem 16, we're going to let f of x equal 2x squared minus 5x minus 3 divided by 2x squared minus 7x minus 15. And we are going to find a y-intercept at a certain point, x-intercepts at certain points, vertical and horizontal asymptotes. So for the y-intercept, all we have to do is let x equal 0. Letting x equal 0 will make a numerator of minus 3 and a denominator of minus 15. That simplifies down to y equals 1 fifth. So we have the point 0, 1 fifth. Horizontal asymptotes can be found by looking at the degree of the numerator and denominator. They have equal degree. So the horizontal asymptote can be found as the ratio of the leading coefficients, 2 over 2, which is 1. For x-intercepts and vertical asymptotes, we know we need to factor the numerator and denominator of this polynomial respectively, which takes a little work, which is why I've saved it for the end. They factor respectively as 2x plus 1 times x minus 3 over 2x plus 3 times x minus 5. There are no shared roots, so there are no holes to worry about. Roots of the numerator will be x-intercepts. Roots of the denominator will be vertical asymptotes. The roots are fairly straightforward to find because we already have them factored. So the x-intercepts are at the point minus 1 half comma 0 and 3 comma 0, and vertical asymptotes are given by x equals negative 3 half, halves and x equals 5. In problem 17, we have f of x equals 2x squared plus 13x plus 20 over 3x squared minus 7x minus 6, and we're going to do the same thing. We need to find y-intercepts, x-intercepts, vertical and horizontal asymptotes. So as before, the y-intercept is found simply by setting x equal to 0. We compute the numerator and denominator to get 20 over negative 6, which simplifies as negative 10 thirds. So when x is 0, y is negative 10 thirds. We're going to do the horizontal asymptote next because it's the easiest to find. The numerator and denominator still have the same degree, so we take the ratio of the leading coefficients and get y is equal to 2 thirds. For the x-intercepts and vertical asymptotes, we need to factor the numerator and denominator. It takes some work, but here it is. f of x is 2x plus 5 times x plus 4 over 3x plus 2 times x minus 3. There are no shared factors, there are no shared roots, so there's no holes to worry about. Roots of the numerator will be the x-intercepts, and they're pretty straightforward to find, negative 5 halves and negative 4. And roots of the denominator will be vertical asymptotes, and they're also pretty easy to find at negative 2 thirds and 3. For problem 18, find the equation of the vertical asymptote and the slant asymptote of the rational function f of x equals negative 36x squared minus 30x plus 10 divided by negative 6x minus 7. Now the vertical asymptote can be found simply by setting the denominator equal to 0, and the slant asymptote will be found by long division. So there's a root of the denominator at x equals negative 7 sixths. In order to conclude that it's a vertical asymptote, however, we need to be sure that it's not also a root of the numerator. We're just going to go ahead and plug negative 7 sixths into the numerator. We do not get out 0, in fact we get negative 4. So since x equals negative 7 sixths is a root of the denominator and not the numerator, it's not a whole, so it's a vertical asymptote. For a slant asymptote, we're going to go ahead and do the long division. We set up negative 6x minus 7 going into negative 36x squared minus 30x plus 10. To cancel out the leading term, we need a 6x. We subtract the relevant product. We're left with 12x plus 10. To cancel out its leading term, we need a minus 2, which gives us a minus 12x plus 14 for a remainder of minus 4. The remainder not being 0 
does verify for us that that denominator, negative 6x minus 7, does not go into the numerator without remainder. In other words, it's not a factor of the numerator. In other words, x equals minus 7 sixths is not a whole. But right up here, this is what we were looking for for our slant asymptote. By the way, this works when the numerator has degree 1 larger than the denominator. You'll get a linear slant asymptote. If the degree of the numerator is more than one degree larger than that of the denominator, you can still go through this process. You'll simply get an asymptote that is not a line, but perhaps a parabola, a cubic, etc. But there's our slant asymptote at y equals 6x minus 2. In problem 19, we're simply asked to find the slant asymptote of the following rational function. f of x equals 2x cubed minus 8x squared plus 7x minus 15 divided by 2x squared minus 5. We just have to set up the long division, but note, in the denominator, we're missing an x term, so we need to keep track of that with a coefficient of 0. So we have 2x squared plus 0x minus 5 going into 2x cubed minus 8x squared plus 7x minus 15. To cancel out the 2x cubed, we just need an x, so we subtract the relevant product. To cancel out the minus 8x squared, we need a minus 4. We subtract the relevant product, and we get 12x minus 35. So now we have a term whose degree is smaller than the denominator we started with, so the division algorithm now stops. We have our remainder, it's 12x minus 35. However, it's the quotient that gives us our slant asymptote of x minus 4. So y equals x minus 4 is the slant asymptote of this rational function. In problem 20, let f of x equal the square root of x squared minus 2x minus 35 over x minus 1, and we want to write the domain of f as an interval. So there's two things that we need to be careful of here. First, we can never have a denominator of 0. Also, whatever we're putting under a radical cannot be negative. The first point is fairly easy. We cannot divide by 0, we're dividing by x minus 1, so we exclude x equals 1 from the domain. For the second, however, we end up with the following inequality. x squared minus 2x minus 35 over x minus 1 has to be bigger than or equal to 0. We're going to use the number line method, so we need to factor the numerator to find its roots. It factors as x minus 7 times x plus 5, all divided now by x minus 1. So x equals 7 is a crossing root. It's a root because it's a 0 of the numerator, and its multiplicity is 1, which is odd, so it's crossing. x equals minus 5, similarly, is a crossing root. And x equals 1 is a vertical asymptote. It's a root of the denominator that is not simultaneously a root of the numerator. And because its multiplicity is odd, this tells us it's crossing. It doesn't cross the axis, but it will change sign. Continuing, we've already excluded x equal 1 from the domain. We know we need to solve x minus 7 times x plus 5 over x minus 1 is bigger than or equal to 0. We've already determined that x equal minus 5 and 7 are crossing roots, and that x equals 1 is a crossing vertical asymptote, by which I mean it will take different signed values on either side. So here's our number line. x equals minus 5 is a crossing root, x equals 7 is a crossing root, x equals 1 is a crossing vertical asymptote, which I simply abbreviate as VA. We're going to just plug x equals 0 and test. The rational function x minus 7 times x plus 5 over x minus 1 is equal to positive 35, so when x is 0, the function is positive. Moving to the left, because we have a crossing root, over here we are negative. Now going back to that test value of 0 and moving to the right. Since we have a vertical asymptote in a region which is positive, it goes to plus infinity on this side. Because it's a crossing vertical asymptote and went to plus infinity on the left, it goes to minus infinity on the right, which means this whole region must be negative, and now that we have a crossing root at 7, this region is positive. So we're going to exclude from the domain anywhere that the rational function whose inequality we just solved is negative. So we've already excluded x equals 1 and anywhere else we now exclude where the rational function was negative. <clears throat> so we get rid of everything to the left of negative 5, we keep everything from minus 5 to 1, we include negative 5, that will make what's under the radical 0, but that's fine. We exclude 1 because we attempt to divide by x minus 1. Then we ignore anything where the rational function is negative because we cannot take its square root, but observe starting at x equals 7, we will have the rational function be 0, which is fine, and from that point forward it will be positive. For problem 21, we need to solve a rational inequality x plus 12 times x minus 4 over x minus 1 is bigger than or equal to 0. This was essentially a part of the previous problem, so this is a little easier. We'll put down our number line. We have crossing roots at x equals minus 12 and x equals 4. These are roots of multiplicity 1 of the numerator, so they're 
roots. Their multiplicity is odd, so they're crossing. x equals 1 is a vertical asymptote of this function because it's a root of the denominator that is not also a root of the numerator. And because it is of odd multiplicity, it is crossing, by which I mean it takes opposite signed values on opposite sides. So here's our number line with the crossing roots and crossing vertical asymptote plus down. We could use a test value, but we can do this a different way. The numerator has degree one larger than the denominator. So there is a slant asymptote. We could compute it, but we don't really need to know much about it. All, we ca all I care about the slant asymptote is, is, is it increasing or decreasing? The denominator x minus one goes into a numerator that begins with x squared. So the leading coefficient of the slant asymptote will be plus one, AKA the slope of the slant asymptote is one. So the slant asymptote is increasing. So here's our number line with our roots and vertical asymptote. We've determined that the slant asymptote has positive slope, which means as X goes to infinity, the slant asymptote goes to infinity as well. It's an increasing line. And the rational function will approach this slant asymptote, so it must go to positive infinity as well. So on the rightmost piece of all of these intervals we have here, where x goes to infinity, the function must be positive. Now we can simply work from right to left. So we have a crossing root, so I become negative. I have a vertical asymptote in a region where I'm negative, so it goes to minus infinity. And on the other side, it goes to plus infinity because it was a crossing vertical asymptote. Now I'm positive in this region, and because I have a crossing root, I'm negative to the left. Ultimately, we were interested in this rational function being non-negative. So at x equals minus 12, the function is 0, which is included. We are positive all the way up to including 1, which we do not include because it's a vertical asymptote. Then we have a whole region where the function is negative, but as x goes from 4 to infinity and including 4, it is bigger than or equal to 0 again. In problem 22, we're going to solve the rational inequality x plus 8 over x plus 3 is larger than negative 1. Now the number line technique we've been doing so far has explicitly been about finding roots of the numerator and denominator of some expression so that we know exactly where the function can change sign between positive and negative. However, in this inequality, we're not comparing something to zero, which means the change from positive to negative is not immediately important. So let's change the inequality that we're solving. If we add one to both sides, now we have something that is being compared to zero. However, we need to have a single fraction compared to zero for our current methods to work. Otherwise, one of the terms being zero might not make the entire expression zero. So the one that we're going to change to x plus three over x plus three, giving these two terms a common denominator so that we can add them together. And now we have the inequality two x plus 11 over x plus three is bigger than zero. We have a single fraction compared to zero. And we're gonna solve this inequality instead. It is equivalent to the one that we began with. This step here, by the way, where we changed one into x plus three over x plus three can only be done if x is not equal to negative three, otherwise we'd have zero over zero. However, we were already implicitly assuming x is not equal to negative three because we already had the term x plus eight over x plus three that had that x plus three down in the denominator. So we've established that instead of the original problem, we can simply solve two x plus 11 over x plus three is bigger than zero. And now we can use our number line technique. So x equals negative 11 over two is a root of the numerator and there's only one fraction. So it will make that expression zero. And x equals minus three is a vertical asymptote. The multiplicity of both of these things is one, which is odd. So both of them are crossing. And again, when I say a vertical asymptote is crossing, what I really mean is it changes sign from one side to the other. We'll just pick a test value of x equals zero. That is to the right of x equals minus three. And if you plug x equals zero into the expression two x plus 11 over x plus three, you get a positive number, 11 over three specifically. So over here on this interval, the entire function is positive, which means this side of the vertical asymptote goes to positive infinity. It's a crossing asymptote, so this side goes to minus infinity, so this region is negative. Then we have a crossing zero, so this region is positive. Now we can just find where our new inequality holds. We're looking for two x plus 11 over x plus three to be positive, and it's on the interval from negative infinity up to negative 11 over two, which we do not include because that's where the function is zero, which is not included in our inequality. And then again on the interval from negative three to infinity, and we don't include negative three because that's a vertical asymptote of the function. 
In problem 23, we'll solve the rational inequality x squared minus 12x plus 35 over x squared plus 18x plus 81 is less than zero. We have a single fraction compared to zero, so we can just go straight to the method we've been using. We need to factor the numerator and denominator. The numerator factors as x minus five times x minus seven and the denominator as x plus nine squared. So note now that in the denominator, x equals negative nine is a vertical asymptote, but it has even multiplicity, which means it's a non-crossing vertical asymptote. So whatever happens on one side will be the same as the other. So at x equals negative nine, we have a non-crossing asymptote, and then at x equals positive five and seven, we have crossing roots of the function. So let's continue with the number line method. We had found that x equals negative nine was a non-crossing asymptote, meaning it does the same thing on both sides. x equals five and x equals seven are crossing roots. We'll do a test value. We'll let x equals zero and get a positive value of 35 over 81, which means the function is positive on this entire interval. Let's move to the left now. We can complete everything that way. Since we have a vertical asymptote and we're positive on this interval, this side must go to plus infinity. It's a non-crossing asymptote, so this other side does the same thing, meaning that the function is positive on this entire interval as well. Now moving to the right of the positive test value that we plugged in, we have a crossing root, so this interval the function is negative, another crossing root, on this interval it's positive. We were looking for something to be negative that only happens on one interval from five to seven, not including either endpoint because we did not want to include zero and x equals five and x equals seven are roots. Problem 24, let's solve the inequality three x over seven minus x is less than x. Now, once again, we do not have something being compared to zero, so we're gonna slide everything to one side, so we do have something being compared to zero. Then we're gonna get a single fraction, so that comparison to zero really gives us useful information in the numerator. So I'm gonna move everything to the left, doesn't actually matter which side you pick. So three x over seven minus x minus x should be less than zero. I'm gonna give that a common denominator of seven minus x. Now I can combine all of the terms by distributing the x and doing the relevant subtraction. So we have three x minus seven x plus x squared over seven minus x is less than zero. Combining terms, x squared minus four x over seven minus x should be less than zero. We can factor an x out of the numerator and there we have an inequality that we can now attempt to solve. So from our original problem, we found the equivalent problem that x times x minus four over seven minus x should be less than zero. x equals zero and x equals four are roots of multiplicity one, which is odd, which make that crossing roots, whereas x equals seven is a crossing vertical asymptote as it also has odd multiplicity. So here's our number line. We have crossing roots at x equals zero and four and a crossing vertical asymptote at x equals seven. We're gonna pick a test value of x equal one. We can't pick zero because we know what happens there. It's a root of the function. So we pick a test value of one and we end up with a negative value. So the function is negative on this entire interval. And now we can start filling out the rest. Moving to the left, since we go across a crossing root, we change to positive. To the right, another crossing root means positive. This side of the vertical asymptote goes to plus infinity. It's a crossing asymptote. So this side goes to minus infinity and therefore the function is negative on this entire interval. We're looking for where this function is negative. So we have two intervals from zero to four, not including either of the roots on either side because we did not want to include zero in this inequality. Then again, from seven to infinity, and we don't include seven because we never include our vertical asymptotes. Problem 25, let's solve the rational inequality. Eight over x minus three is bigger than six over x minus one. So again, we're going to move everything to one side so we have a comparison to zero, and then we're gonna to need to combine things into a single term. So I'm gonna subtract six over x minus one to the left-hand side. I need to give them a common denominator, and there's not much to do except for the product three minus x times x minus one. So the first term is being multiplied by x minus one over x minus one, and the second term is being multiplied by three minus x over three minus x. This does give both terms the same denominator, but we do need to distribute both of those numerators. Now that they have the same denominator, we can go ahead and do the subtraction to get 14x minus 26 over the product three minus x times x minus one. The numerator, I can factor a two out if important. And since we want to find vertical asymptotes eventually, we're not going to distribute out that denominator. So now we have the following problem, the fully factored single term rational function two times seven X minus 13 over three minus X times X minus one should be positive. So we have a crossing root at X equals 13 over seven and crossing vertical asymptotes at X equals three and X equals one. So we put those down on our number line. We're gonna plug in a test value, X equals zero is pretty straightforward. Produces a negative numerator and a negative denominator. So overall the result is positive. 
So at x equals 0, we're positive, so we're positive on the entire interval up to x equals 1. Now we can just continue. As we approach a vertical asymptote, we go to plus infinity, minus infinity on the other side, etc., etc. This is fairly old hat now, so we're just keeping track of whether vertical asymptotes and roots are crossing or not and moving from one side to the other. We were looking for this rational function to be positive, and we find it only happens on the intervals from minus infinity to 1. We do not include x equals 1 because we never include vertical asymptotes. Then the function is positive again from 13 sevenths to 3. We're not including 3 because it's a vertical asymptote, and we're not including 13 over 7 because that would be a root of the function and 0 was excluded from the original inequality.